Hello and welcome to Inside Grand Prix in Malaysia. Here today, things get hot, really hot. Very tough for the drivers. And above all for the new engines. Man muss ja jeden Furz und Feuerstand im Auto extra kühlen. Plus two men like fire and ice and both want to win. The aim is the same. Welcome to Formula One in Malaysia. Malaysia, population of nearly 30 million, a big city jungle, a mecca for nature lovers. The country's landmark, the Petronas Towers, at 552 meters among the world's tallest buildings. Typical for Malaysia, rain and up to 90% humidity. It's uh, very, very humid there and very tough for the drivers. Humidity makes fantastic rainforests and deep within, Nico Rosberg and Lewis Hamilton on the agenda filming for sponsors. Never before have so many rare species wandered around in the Malaysian jungle. That's worth a photo. For the drivers too, there's the odd exotic memory. After the jungle photo shoot, a visit to Kuala Lumpur's Children's Heart Clinic. Together busying themselves with chemistry experiments, liquid nitrogen amazes kids both big and small. The final summing up from model pupil, Nico Rosberg. Chemistry wasn't really my subject, it was more physics or maths, but it was naturally interesting to see this here too. I'd never seen liquid nitrogen like that before. It's now evening in Malaysia. Outside, it's cooling down and becoming a bit more pleasant. Time to go out to eat, there's plenty of options. Above all, poultry. Typical two soups from various colorful ingredients. And then it gets very difficult because I usually can't tell at all. What was that now actually? Was that pigeon or fish or somehow a piece of turnip cabbage? I find it very hard to tell. Outside of the big city jungle, the nightlife plays out at the evening markets. The stands don't start selling until 4 p.m. This is where the locals meet to eat, drink and chat away until gone midnight. Any tourists accidentally ending up here are very welcome. Well, at least with no camera. Now, a lot of hot air about nothing, or will the cars here blow up in our face? A brutal 35 degrees, 90% air humidity, hardly any cooling from the airstream. Fireproof underwear, four liters of liquid loss during the race. Drink, drink, drink. 90 minutes cooped up in carbon, like a caterpillar in a cocoon. Ahead of the Grand Prix, the always identical facts and superlatives. For 16 years, the drivers here have been performing the almost unimaginable. You go into a mild sauna, set it to 60 degrees or so, take your rowing machine or exercise bike with you and off you go. Within 10 minutes, you'll soon know what it feels like. And for one player this time, it's going to get even hotter than before. Much hotter, up to the limit, and perhaps even beyond it as well. The engine, or to put it better, the power unit. Robbed of a cylinder pair, but enriched by turbocharger, exhaust turbine and larger batteries. They have to deliver twice the previous electrical output, 160 horsepower, for 33 seconds instead of 7. In addition, the energy stores are now fed from two generators, the MGUK for kinetic on the rear axle and the MGUH for heat on the turbocharger's shaft. 
high performance batteries, permanent charging and discharging that creates enormous heat. Thus, every innovation makes further measures necessary, getting very complex. Because every bell and whistle on the car needs to be separately cooled, intercooler, supercharged air, engine, batteries, every battery package needs new cooling. We've never had so many coolers in Formula One. More cooling means a greater airstream, which has to flow through larger openings and radiators. On the flat-out sections of Sepang, a manageable task, more a problem for the aerodynamic engineers, for whom openings and large parts are inherently a thorn in their side. But what if the safety car in Sepang again has to slow the field down? or if a rival refuses to be passed. In the slipstream, you soon lose proper cooling. Or if there's no airflow at all. One of the concerns you've got is, is a long spell on the grid, for example, uh, at the start of a race where you've got no cooling air going through any of the systems, the charge coolers aren't cooling. While the engine now has two cylinders fewer, it produces more heat as the efficiency has been increased. And it depends on the interplay of all the modules, including external factors. What makes it hot under the driver's seat is a delicate network of systems. It needs exact pressure levels and temperature ranges. A couple of degrees too much can cause the volcano to erupt. 1,200 degree exhaust fumes next to highly sensitive batteries. The cramped conditions in the back of an F1 car don't help at all. The exhaust is feeding the turbo. Uh, that whole area is incredibly hot. Um, the turbos are much closer to bits of the car that, 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 than we've been used to with just the exhaust systems before. Um, so all, all of that needs managing and all of it is prone to causing you a problem at some point. Avoid overheating the engine. It's written in every car manual. It says doing so will shorten engine life. In 2014, a power unit must last for around 4,000 kilometers, or 800 laps over four weekends. And at least one of them should be a perfect one in qualifying. And what this perfect lap feels like and what it needs to achieve, it's each team's individual secret. You go through all the data, you look at the information uh, that is available to us, which is a lot, and you try and get the car as close as you possibly can to the perfect setup. The competitive differentiation in Formula One today is fractions of percent, it's fractions of a second. Therefore, you can't rely on seat of the pants judgment. You've got to have data, you've got to analyze that data, you've got to make good decisions based upon it. For me, understanding the data is not so much about looking at the data lines itself. You know, they do just look like wiggly lines on the face of it, but actually by relating them to each other and to the driver's comments, you build up a picture of what the car and the driver are doing, and by understanding that, you can then look to see how you can improve the car or help the driver change his lines and look for that ultimate perfect lap. doesn't only rely on their driver, although obviously he's the majority of it, um, but the car, the setup of the car, yeah, every little bit on the car makes a difference. It's the parts that are supplied out to us, yeah, it's the design of it, it's, it's everything uh, that comes together uh, to just make that one, one good lap, really. You can't say to the driver, this is the perfect lap, go out and drive it. It doesn't work like that. At the end of the day, there's a huge human element in driving these cars. Personally, uh, I don't feel that you can achieve the perfect lap. I mean, what is perfection anyway? Sometimes you, you know that you have been doing the perfect lap. You know what 
you were doing before and you go for it and you know that well that was the lap I could I could have done and then you look at the on the stopwatch and say well that was good but sometimes you drive you drive the perfect lap but if the car is not there then it's just nowhere near so it's uh, in between having the good car and doing the good job well, as you know, speed is one of the big attributes and we thought that speed and consistency is something that represents the DHL brand name. So finding the driver who over a whole season consistently got the number one fastest time the most should get something a little bit special. You need to have the speed and the, the strength of a fighter to be able to cope with the G-forces and the reactions during a race. But they also need to have um, the concentration skills and the, the strategy design of a, of a chess grandmaster. So you try to go as fast as you can anyway, but you do, of course, also have to apportion a few things in the last few years above all the tyres. Perfect lap is optimization. It's optimization of the data, the data from aerodynamics data from the tyres. We've given him what we think is theoretically the best for that day, for that car, for that condition. We've set the car up for the maximum. The rest is up to him. A short break, then we continue with the question, will the Ferrari drivers be driving in Malaysia with or against each other? And Eddie Irvine, the last macho man seen in Formula One. So don't go away. <laughs>